Welcome to the preaching ministry of Grace Community Baptist Church in Cecil to Maryland. Our prayer is that you discover the purpose and the presence of God in your life as we unlock the scriptures one verse at a time. Take the truth of your word, massage it into our hearts and into our minds. Grant us the understanding, Father, and I pray that you will speak to us today. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, I, uh, in just normal study, I guess, uh, ran across a scripture that caught my eye, and it's in Isaiah, and it's uh, in Isaiah uh, chapter 40, and in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verse 15, I believe, I've often wondered when God looks down and he sees this earth and he sees all these nations, America, Russia, Iran, all of the nations that are all over the world, what's God's view of that? What's God's view of all these nations? And I ran across this, it's in Isaiah 40, verse 15, and here's what it says. It says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. The nations are as a drop in the bucket, and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles, the islands, as a very little thing. And so when you think about it in a whole scheme of things, it made me think, and I began to realize just how much that I was allowing the world to uh, influence me. Uh, I looked at all of the labels that are out there. Believe me, we have a multitude of groups out there. Uh, you know, you can be right, you can be left, you can be a red state, a blue state, you can be independent, you can be a Democrat, a Republican, you can be, be pro-life, you can be pro-choice. We have all of these groups out there. And when I began to reflect on that, it dawned on me that all of these multiple groups that we have out there are not solving anything. If anything, they are multiplying the division and the corruption that we are experiencing uh, in our world today. And so I said, I need to be remember. I need to go back because uh, right now, the way that I feel, I don't want to be considered right. I don't want to be considered left. I don't want to be liberal. I don't want to be conservative. I don't want to be a Democrat. I don't want to be a Republican. I don't want to be, I don't want the label. What I want to be is a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to be. So how do I do that? And so that's kind of the crux of, of all of the things that it seems like the guy was just, just opened this up for me. Uh, it's not earth shattering. It's not some new truth, newfangled truth, but it spoke to my heart and I wanted to share it with you. Now, I don't know, have you ever wondered what it was like in Jesus' day? What was the world like in Jesus' day? Well, Jesus actually lived in probably one of history's most corrupt societies uh, in biblical times. He lived in a society that was every bit as pagan and corrupt in our, as today's culture is that we live in. They had tyrants. They had dictators that ruled throughout the region. Not only that, slavery was firmly entrenched in the society and in the Roman culture uh, as, uh, uh, as it was there. Uh, legal and economic oppression of the Jews by Rome was running rampant all over the place. But even in spite and in the midst of all of that that was going on in the world and the situation that it was in, Jesus never issued a call for political changes. Not one time. He never issued a call for political changes. He never attempted to kind of capture the culture. Uh, if you will, for biblical morality. He didn't come to the earth to be a political or social reformer. That's not why he came. He didn't come to earth uh, to do that. He came to establish a new spiritual order. He came not to make the old order uh, moral through social and government uh, reform, but what he wanted to do was to make the new creatures, his people, us, the Christians that are here, holy through say, the saving power of the gospel and also the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. That's why he was here. So I'm thinking, forget all of this stuff. Forget all of these things that are going on because they don't accomplish. They're not doing uh, 
solving any of the issues, and especially us as Christians, because we have what the world needs. We don't need a better government. We need better people in government. <laughs> and the only thing that changes people's lives is the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in lives. You transform people's lives and everything else takes care of itself. So we get all hung up on all of the issues of the day, and rightfully so. We should be upset. I thought about that. I said, you know, they have a law that I hate, and the law says that it's legal to have an abortion. So it says it's legal to have an abortion, but the law doesn't say that you have to have one. They still have a choice. Even though it's legal, they have a choice. They don't have to do that. So I'm thinking what that tells me is that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to come alongside them and help them to know that there is forgiveness uh, involved there. If you've uh, had an abortion, there is guidance and wisdom and help and people that will come alongside you and encourage you and help you along the way and use that to share the gospel of Christ as we demonstrate His love by coming alongside Him. The same way with all of the social issues that are there. People need to understand that if there's forgiveness involved. There, if you're involved in a homosexual lifestyle, there's forgiveness involved in that. God loves you. He, he sent Jesus to die on the cross for the sinfulness of mankind. And forgiveness is readily available if you ask it. People need to understand that God loves them and that mercy's there. They need to understand that nobody is going to hell for anything that they've done. People are going to be in hell for what they didn't do, and that's put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So I began to reflect and to think about all of those things that were, that were going on and, and, and happening in our life. And so uh, to try to illustrate that, I want to give you this, this picture of the Christian world. It can probably be best illustrated by the analogy of a train station. And I, 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 this is... Hopefully it'll speak to you like it did to me. So we Christians, that's us, the followers of Jesus Christ, the world is a train station, and we Christians are waiting in the station to board a northbound heavenly train. But we are surrounded in this train station by people who are preparing to board the southbound train, but they are absolutely, completely unaware of its tragic and horrible destination. They have no idea where it's headed and where it's going. So here's the question. Should we spend our time and energy pleading with them to switch trains? You need to be on the northbound train, not the southbound train. Or do we spend our time trying to clean up the train station? So are we going to spend our time cleaning up the train station or are we going to spend our time saying, you don't want to be on that train. You want to be on this train. You don't want to go down that path. You want to go down this path. And we do that by how we live, how we treat one another, and by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the answer is obvious. And those that would clean up the culture uh, simply for culture's sake, not only are they missing the point, they're misunderstanding the reason that God leads us in the world. And that is to be his witnesses to the lost. That's why he's left us here in the world. That's what we need to do. So in Jesus' day, he lived in a time in society when it was just as corrupt. They had tyrants. They had dictators. They were being oppressed legally, you know. Uh, you know, every kind of way that the Jews could be oppressed by the, by the Romans. They were, they were overtaxed. Uh, you know, it was just a horrible time. But yet Jesus wasn't calling for political reform. He wasn't calling for that. You know, the first thing that came to my mind, you remember what Jesus told Pilate? He said up there and he says what? My kingdom is what? Not of this world. So his kingdom is not of this world. He said, my kingdom is not of this world, Pilate. If it was, then my servants would be fighting for me now. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. So his kingdom is not of this world. Where I'm going to be, it's not of this world. You know, so that goes back to the thing, well, we're in the world physically, but we're not of the world. Have you ever thought about that and just kind of dwelt on that for just a moment? You know, what does that mean? When we read uh, this word of world in the New Testament, what we're reading is the Greek word cosmos. And cosmos, typically, cosmos refers to 
uh, the inhabited earth and the people who live on the earth, which functions apart from God. So Satan is the ruler of this world. In fact, 1 John 5, 19 says it like this. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So once you begin to grasp this definition of that, the definition that the, the word world refers to a world system that is ruled by Satan, then you can begin to appreciate, not only appreciate, but understand Christ's claim that believers are no longer of the world. We are no longer ruled by sin, nor are we bound by the principles of the world. We're not bound by the ideologies and the dogma of the world. We're not bound by those principles. And so we're being changed into the image of Christ, causing, as we're being changed into the image of Christ, that causes our interest in the things of the world to become less and less as we mature in Christ. Now, hopefully that makes sense to you because when we say that we're supposed to be in the world physically but not of the world, we're not bound by those that are lost. I'm not bound by the ideologies or the dogma or the principles that this world is trying to dictate to me. What I am bound by is right here, and it's the Word of God. This is how I want to live. This is what I want to do. I want to be all that God wants me to be. I want to live the way that God wants me to live, and He has given me His Word, His instructions of life right here. Not only that, but he gave me his spirit to give me the understanding of this. So why am I allowing myself to get all caught up in all of this rhetoric that's out there? When I look at the example that Jesus Christ provided us, that's exact, he was laser focused on accomplishing all that the Father wanted to do in and through him while he was here on this earth. And that should be exactly what we're doing exactly what we're doing. I don't want to be right. I don't want to be left. I don't want to be Republican. I don't want to be Democrat. I want to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, which means I'm going to live my entire life solely on the Word of God and what the Word of God tells me. I'm not going to be bound. I'm not going to be bound by the ideologies or the dogma or the principles of this world because Satan is the ruler of this world. And I don't want to be bound by that. Sin has no business being having control over my life. Once you realize that, that is probably one of the most liberating feelings you can have. I'm not bound by that. I'm not bound by that. I'm not holier than now. I'm not trying to set myself up on a pedestal far from it. But I want to humble myself and I want to put my faith and trust in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to study the Word. I want to take it, hide it in my heart, and I want to demonstrate His love as He transforms my life through His Holy Spirit to be more and more like Him, which means I am less and less interested in what the world has to say. And so as I begin to do that, as I begin to do that and focus on those things, then it opens up a whole new avenue. It opens up a whole new avenue because I'm not bound by those things. I don't want to be caught up in those things. I don't want that to control me. Have you noticed one thing? When you go out now and you go out and about and you go out and you look and people are saying, well, did you see what so-and-so posted on Facebook or this or that? And I can't believe this. They watch 15 minutes of cable news and they're ready to fight everybody when they get to work, man. I mean, you know, come on, come on. Let's just, you know, I'm tired of this. Did you see that? You know, I can't believe, you know. And I mean, it, it, it affects them emotionally. They get emotionally involved and they get emotionally in, into that. And Satan's jumping up and down and hollering. He says, that's great. I want you to be involved. I want you to be so caught up in that because if you're so caught up in that, then you are as far away from what God wants you to do as you can be. And folks, that's what we got to stop. If we're going to come together right here, I, you know, when you look at the whole world, it's, that's a humongous task. But when you break that down to say right here where we live, right here in this little area, right here where we live, then, you know, how does, that, how does that affect us? What can we do? So as believers, we need to understand that we're in the world, meaning that we're physically present here, but we're not part of the world. Uh, in John, the Gospel of John, Jesus, when he was praying for his disciples and us, uh, he said in John 17, verse 14, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world 
just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. That was Jesus' prayer to us. And so that's where we want our focus to be. That's what we want to do. I'll try to... So how, how, how does that break? How does that affect us? You know, what, what are we going to do? Well, number one is uh, we need to behave like Christians. We need to behave like Christians. And how does Christians behave? Well, look in Romans chapter 12. I'll just give you a few examples here. Romans 12, beginning in verse 9. It says, uh, let love be without hypocrisy. Adhor uh, or hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor. Giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We need to have those kind of attributes, those kind of things in our life. Behave like a Christian should. Our behavior should be that. Our attitude should. The other thing is we want to be a good citizen. The very next chapter in Romans 13, it tells us that submit to government. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authority that exists are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And so they go through and tell us to be law-abiding citizens. Pay your taxes and, 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 and obey the law until the law uh, contradicts God's law. But I'm saying we want to be just, just model citizens or an example of what a good citizen should be. But we're going to stand firm on what God tells us. So those are some of the things that, that we can begin to do right here, right now. We can say that the area of ministry in our, in our area right here, uh, in terms of, of things, the social issues, abortion and all of that, we can just have the attitude that this is just a no, abor no abortion community, period. It's just no abortion community. We want to do everything we can to provide the encouragement, the support, the prayer, uh, physically, spiritually, emotionally, every way that we can to support single mothers out there or anybody that, that needs help, that's, that's, that's going through a decision, that feels guilty, maybe they've had an abortion. We want them to know that God loves them and we love them and God forgives them and we don't hold any grudges and we don't pass any judgment and we can come alongside those people and we can make a difference in people's lives and we can use those opportunities to share the gospel. We can do those kinds of things. That's just an example of what we can do. Think about all of the things that are going on over here. Think about the people that you know that are sick and doing that and by calling and just uh, sending a card or a phone call or just uh, you know, praying for somebody and, and, and doing those kinds of things to encourage and to uplift people and to help them know that there are people out there that love them, that care for them. We've gotten so wrapped up and the world has convinced us that we're losing this idea of community and the Christian community can come together. If you look in Acts 2, it said that the people continued to meet together. They broke bread. They were studied under the apostles' doctrine. They did, you know, all of these things, they fellowshiped together. They did those things. And so those are the things that we need to do. That's what people are hungry for. That's what people want to see. That's what people want to experience. And that's the love of God that shines through. We have to put our faith in God. Forget about all this other stuff. It's only temporary anyway, and this world's not going to last. As Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So I'm not concerned about this world. I'm not concerned about it at all. I'm going to go on. I want to be a model citizen. I want to participate in society. But I, I want my number one priority to be the study of God's word. Not only the study of it, 
not only the study of it, but the application of it. I want to be sh not to be ashamed, not to be afraid, and, and to be bold in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we look at the example of Jesus, when we look at the example of Paul, when we look at the example of Timothy, Peter, or any of the disciples, that's what they did. That was their focus. That's what they were about. That's what they focused on. And they turned the world upside down. So can you imagine what we can do in the little area that we live in right here by doing those things? When was the last time that you sat down with somebody and shared the gospel truths from God's word? When, is it, when was the last time you sat down and said, let me show you a scripture in the Bible, Romans 3, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you understand that? Do you know what that means? When was the last time you asked somebody, you know that everybody's going to have to face three questions in their life. One, there's going to come a time when you're going to exhale for the last time. What do you believe is going to happen to you when that happens? That's the first question. The next question is, why do you believe it? Why do you believe that? And the third question is, what is your source of truth? What are you basing that on? You could talk about organized religion. You could talk about social issues. You could talk about anything you want to talk about. But when it all comes down to it, there it is. That's it right there. There's going to come a time when they're going to call the family in. The family will gather around. They'll be all in there, and you can hear them talking, but you, you, don't, you, you, you can't respond, but you understand what they're saying, and you can feel your body's systems uh, slowly but surely beginning to shut down, and you know that any moment, at any moment, you're going to exhale for the last time. And so the question you're going to have to answer is, what happens to me then? You can kick the can down the road. You can put it off. You can procrastinate. You can put it off. You can do anything you want to do, but you're going to have to face that. There's no getting around it. So when was the last time that you talked to somebody like that? We had the best news in the world to say that God loves you. God loves you, and he loves you so much that his mercy and forgiveness is available. You know, when you put your faith and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, submit to him as Lord over your life. He'll guide you, direct you, you know. You have the hope of eternal life. You don't have to worry about it. You know where you're going. You know what's going to happen. You have purpose, meaning, direction. You have a foundation that you can build a life on. All of those things become available once you put your faith and trust in Jesus. So when was the last time you sat down and talked to somebody about that? When was the last time any of us did, for that matter? When was the last time that you've done that? You know, how, you know what's, what's wrong with us that we've, we've recoiled into our shell? Uh, I love the book of 2 Timothy. One of the reasons that I like that book is it's literally the, uh, Paul's uh, last words. Uh, he was in prison in Rome, uh, and he recognized the fact that his... Uh, earthly life was fixing to come to an end and so he wanted to write this letter it was his last words to encourage Timothy but not only Timothy but to us and so here's what here's Paul's last words uh, to us and and to the the uh, 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 believers uh, that are out there and so Paul comes through and in, in 2 Timothy uh, 2 uh, verse uh, 15 listen to what he says he says so, so what do we need to do He's telling Timothy, he says, look, he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is a disciplined, systematic Bible study time to where I study the word of God. I want to rightly divide the word of God. If I'm going to share the gospel truths, then I need to understand the gospel truths. I need to do that. You don't have to be the Bible answer man and have all the answers. It's okay to say, I don't know, but I'll find out and we'll sit down and study together. But you can share the gospel truths. You can do that and develop a terminology and an understanding of that. That's what he says here. Be diligent. In other words, be consistent. Uh, be committed. Be disciplined in a systematic study of God's Word and studying the Bible. And then he goes on to it and in, in 2 Timothy 3.16. He, he says, listen, Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. Not only that, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It'll guide you. It'll direct you that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's what he's telling Timothy, and that's what he's telling us. 
Be diligent. Be committed. Submit to Jesus Christ as Lord over your life. When you put your faith and trust in Him, you are submitting to Him as Lord over your life. And so when you do that, then you humbly come before Him. His Spirit comes and dwells within you. And as you study the Word of God, the more you study, the more understanding you get, the more direction you get, the more the transformation into Christ's light and it takes place. Sinfulness and sin's control over you begins to diminish and you become more righteous as each day passes. And so you begin to get excited about it. You begin to, to focus on that. You're concerned for those that are lost, whether it be a family member. There's no reason. If we have a family member that's lost, we shouldn't hesitate to share the gospel with them. That's your family. That's your family member, you know, family member. Everybody says, well, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, insult anybody. And I don't want to stir up any trouble. And I don't want to do any of that. Yeah, if they end up in hell, do you think they're going to wish that they had listened to you, that they had listened to what you had to tell them? I mean, don't hesitate. That, when you feel and you sense that God is leading you to share the gospel, then do it. Just do it. Just do it, regardless of what happens, because it doesn't matter. Our success or failure is not dependent on the outcome. It's success or failure is dependent on obedience. Share the gospel. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, he says, Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. He says, because the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Uh, they'll go to their own desires. They'll go their own way. And people do uh, do that, and we know that. We need to be, absolutely need to be more aggressive in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to pray for the opportunity. We need to pray for lost people by name. We need to cultivate relationships, but we need to do it in a loving manner where our behavior is a Christian behavior. People need to look at us, and they need to understand that the most important relationship in our life is our relationship with God Almighty. That, is, that takes precedent over every relationship and everything in our life. And once people begin to see that kind of commitment, that kind of diligence, and that we study the Word of God, whenever temptation comes, whenever you're tempted to go somewhere, you remember what Jesus did? He came back to Satan when Satan tempted him with the Word of God. And so once we, once we begin to study and understand the Word of God, then we can throw that up and we can move right on and we can go over around and through anything that Satan wants to do in our midst and it will not be successful. We have that, that, that capability. We have that within us to be able to do that. So I don't want to get caught up in all of the groups and all of the division and all of the things that are here and all of the things that are happening around here because from my observation on a personal level, every time I see somebody doing that, they get wound up tighter in the eight-day clock and they're ready to go out there and fight the world. They're so divided. They're so upset and they get emotionally involved and they say it's ridiculous, it's this, it's that, it's all of these things that are, that are going on. And they say, I just don't know what's happening to our country. Our country's going down. Well, yeah, <laughs> of course it is. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Man will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying His power, and from such people turn away. Turn away. Turn away. You know, I want them to experience the love of God and I want them to experience the changed life that only God can provide. And that only happens as we become humble, obedient servants of God, diligent in studying His Word, steadfast in prayer, seizing the opportunities to share the gospel. And as, he told, as Peter told us in, in his word, when Peter said, you need to be prepared to give a defense for the faith that's in you. Are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to do that? Could you give a defense for the faith that's in you? Could you share that with somebody if the opportunity came? We've got some tracks back there. They're called Eternal Life tracks, and they're good. And I, you know, people are welcome to take as many as they want. But, but the thing that they're good for is it's the gospel. Uh, it's the Roman road, and it's the gospel pretty much in the book of Romans. But you can read that and develop an understanding, develop, uh, you know, how you would say 
you know, say the gospel truths and say that. You can memorize where the scriptures are. You can show them. You can do it. But it's time to just, you know, rise to the occasion. It's time to stand up and to begin to share the gospel. Did everybody around you, did your family truly honestly believe that the most important relationship in your life is your relationship with God? How do you demonstrate to that to them on a daily basis? How is that demonstrated to them? How do they see that? Do they see that? Do they understand that? We're not perfect, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to slip and fall. But, but overall, the, the consistency that we have and the love that's there and the genuineness that's, that's there and that's about us and about what we do and how we do it is just it, 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 people are hungry for that. They are absolutely hungry for that. Satan is the author of division. He is a liar. There's not one bit of truth that ever comes out of his mouth, and we are experiencing that now. There's some people that are saying, well, are we under the judgment of God? Yes, yes, we are. It says in Romans chapter 1 that it got so bad that God said, I turned you over to a debased mind. God pulls back. What happens when God pulls back? We're right in the middle of that and experiencing it right now. So as believers, we need to understand that, and that should create an urgency in our lives to come together as a Christian community, encourage one another, love one another, speak to one another, fellowship with one another, study the Word of God uh, together, and ask questions and to dig deep and allow God to do it. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't even understand that, by all means, let me know. I will be more than happy to sit down with anybody and let the Spirit of God do what only the Spirit of God can do, and that's grant the understanding of the gospel truths. It will change your life. I promise you that. Not me, but God promises you that in his word. And understand and do not allow ourselves to get drifted away by all of the mess that's going on around us and stay focused on what it is that God wants us to do. We need to be educating our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. We need to be telling them Bible stories. We need to be helping them to understand how much God loves them and what's, you know, what's, what, he's, what he did for them. And, and that comes through the study of that. It's teaching them songs. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. The world says racism, but yet Jesus says, I love them all. And so those are the things that we need to teach our children. We need to teach them the songs. We need to teach them about, uh, you know, David and Goliath. We need to teach them about the walls of Jericho falling down. We need them to understand that. We need them to see that. We need them to experience that and to, and to appreciate those kinds of things. It's absolutely essential and important because I have a feeling there's all kinds of things floating. You have people out there that will take a little bit of this, I like, I like this part, you know, from this denomination and this part from this and this. I'm going to take a little bit of it all and put it all together and come up with some kind of belief system that's there. There's only one belief system, and that comes from the Word of God, and that's right here. It is time. Uh, it, has, it has passed the test of time, and it's there. So as us, when we come together, we want to be a community of believers that comes together right here in Cecilton and the surrounding area. We want to... Break. We want to be more aggressive in looking for ways to establish relationships with those that are around us, those that are in our family, praying all the time for an opportunity to share the gospel. And then I want to be prepared to give a defense for the faith that's in me, for what I have and what I've experienced, and be able to share that with those that are around us. Time is growing short, and the urgency is here. Do not get caught up in the groups and the things that are out there. So we want to be, we want our behavior to behave like Christians, Romans 12, 9 through 21. We want to be good citizens, Romans 13, uh, 1 through 3 and following. And then we want to take Paul's advice in 2 Timothy where he says to have a disciplined, systematic Bible study so that we can rightly divide the Word of God. We want to study the Scriptures because it will equip us uh, for everything we need uh, in order to live a righteous, holy life. We need to share the gospel uh, while we can and while we're still here and able to do that and not worry about the future because our future is secure. I'm not concerned at all about the future, not at all. I'm not going to be worried about where the world's going because I already know 
And so I'm not worried about that. I, I, my future is secure. My citizenship is in heaven. And I'm grateful for that and I'm thankful for that. But I want to be laser focused on what it is that God wants us to do and how we need to do it. We need to develop those relationships. We need to share the gospel. And we need to be about God's business. Father, we just come to you now thankful for this opportunity. Father, I pray that your spirit would speak to us. Help us to mount up and to be your soldiers, your people in this world today. Father, as we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge that we don't have all the answers, but we know you do. Give us... Uh, boldness, give us courage, give us, the, give us the opportunity to share the gospel truths with those that are around us and not be concerned about the outcome, but leave the results to you. Father, we pray for those that are lost in our, in our midst, in the community that we live in, in this geographical location where you've placed us. Open their hearts, Father. Soften it and allow us to be able to share the gospel truths with them. Father, I pray for anybody that's here today that does not know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. If they have any questions, Father, don't walk out of here today until you've let it be known and that you want to understand those truths. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.